Hello, my friend. I have a special invitation for you. I have a new, potent, concentrated group coaching program called Crucible. We begin on April 10th. You can go check out timewitchery.com slash crucible. And I'm going to tell you all about it at the end of the show. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Welcome to Mind Witchery. I'm your host, Natalie Miller, and I'm so glad you're here. Hello. I have to tell you, I am so excited about this episode today. Uh, I'm sitting with butterflies, and honestly, I'm, I'm sitting hoping that I can articulate this idea, this particular spell for getting unstuck in a way that does justice to how beautiful it is in my own head. <laughs> so I'm going to get straight to it today. The spell for getting unstuck is asking the question, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? This is a question I'm a little famous for as a coach. I actually had a client, one of my first clients made me a magnet for my fridge that says, what do I want to do? And in order to tell you more about the spell, because while it is straightforward, this question, what do I want to do? Because we have a fraught to say the least, a fraught relationship with desire, with wanting, it's important for me actually to expound a little bit, to tell you a little bit more about what I mean with this question, what do I want to do, and also a little bit more about where it comes from. Okay, get ready. In order to tell you where this spell comes from, I need to slip into a former identity. I need to become, again, an English professor. So once upon a time, I was getting a PhD in American literature, and I was teaching American Lit classes in universities. And one of my favorite lessons was on Walt Whitman and his poem, Song of Myself. So maybe you remember Leaves of Grass from your own schooling. Maybe you remember that Walt Whitman was a poet in the mid-19th century. Maybe you remember his look. <laughs> He's quite famous for his look. Um, shaggy white beard and big hair, button-down shirts. Song of Myself, arguably Whitman's most famous poem gives us an understanding of how to live an evolutionary life, how to grow, how to enjoy, how to make the most of life. So Whitman himself had an evolutionary and revolutionary life. He was a journalist, he was a poet, he was a publisher, he was eventually a nurse during the Civil War. He was queer, and there are a lot of takes on this, but arguably as open as one could be about one's homosexuality in that moment. He was a self-styled celebrity, and I cannot wait to tell you a little more about that and an acclaimed poet, but I want you to know he was born a poor farmer. He was born to a family with many children. He was born with the expectation that he would work in the way that his father had worked. And what he did instead was began to write not only journalism, um, but also poetry. I say this about Walt Whitman because he really 
in Song of Myself, he preaches this way of being that I really believe he in many ways practiced. And I just love that. Okay, so let's get into the poem. I have in front of me this this book of um, of Whitman's poetry, Leaves of Grass, and uh, it actually belonged to my grandmother. So it's always so fun and special to hold this book in front of me. So we're working on the spell, What Do I Want to Do? Here's the first thing we learn in Song of Myself. Desire is key, and desire lives in the present moment. So Whitman has this beautiful line, urge and urge and urge, always the procreant urge of the world. That is to say, the world is created through urges, through desire. This now that we are inhabiting is being created through our desires. Right before this line, he says, there was never any more inception than there is now. That is to say, this is the beginning. You are beginning. Each moment is a beginning. Nor any more youth or age than there is now. It's never too late. We learn at the beginning of Song of Myself, he writes it when he's 37. And will never be any more perfection than there is now, nor any more heaven or hell than there is now. Now is the moment in which we do. Now is the moment in which we have power. And this is so easy to forget when we're stuck. I find that oftentimes when I'm stuck, when my clients are stuck, We're stuck because we're not living in this moment. Sometimes we are living in the past. This might look like a reluctance to do something new because no one you know has done it before. You look to past experience and you don't see any evidence of it. And so you imagine that you can't do this thing. Or it might be a papering of an old story onto a current moment. Like, I would like to start dating again, but the last time I dated, it was so disastrous. And so I won't because that thing might happen again. So sometimes we get stuck in the past. Sometimes we also get stuck In the future, we get stuck worrying about things that haven't happened. We get stuck creating worst-case scenarios. We get stuck troubleshooting for troubles that aren't even here. So sometimes when someone has a big dream, I'd like to write a novel, they get 20 steps ahead. Oh, but I don't have an agent. It's like, well, (laughs) you could start writing today and then worry about the agent when it's time to worry about the agent. In every case, our power, our agency is in this moment. It is right now. It's not in the future. There will never be any more perfection than there is now, Whitman writes nor any more heaven or hell than there is now. Now is where we move from. So when we ask the question, what do I want to do? That isn't like, oh, I want to become a fighter pilot. Okay, that's a good big future dream. But the question for getting unstuck, what do I want to do right now might be, I want to read about becoming a fighter pilot. I want to look into the Air Force. I'll look at the website today. The question, what do I want to do, asks you to think about this moment right now, where you find yourself in this circumstance. What do you want to do? How might you step onto a creative and evolutionary 
path. Okay, so what do I want to do right now, here in the present moment? Not in some future and not what did I want to do in the past. Here's the next piece. Every answer to the question, what do I want to do, is good. There is, in Whitman himself and in Whitman's poetry, or really I should say in Whitman's persona, because I didn't know him, but I will say that the way that he has styled himself, there is a radical self-acceptance. Oftentimes when I ask clients, what do you want to do? They will say something like, I just want to go back to bed. And my answer, and Walt's answer, is, yeah, go back to bed. What do I want to do? I want to get in the car and start driving. Yeah, get in the car and start driving. There's a moment at the very beginning of the poem. The poem is... Song of Myself is introduced in this way. The very first line, he's all bold. I celebrate myself and sing myself. And then the fourth line is, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. When we think about doing in our culture, it's very active, it's very fiery, it's write and build and create and be active. Whitman would have us remember that loafing and observing and resting and enjoying, all of that is also essential, it's necessary. So what's involved here in accepting your answer to the question, what do I want to do, is so much self-trust. So much self-trust. Trusting that where your inclinations are guiding you is the right direction, even when those inclinations are so countercultural. Elizabeth Gilbert, in her book, Big Magic, tells this fabulous story. She talks about how, you know, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which was an extraordinary best-selling book, and, and actually which got as many haters, maybe that's an exaggeration, a lot of haters along with its lovers. But you can imagine that after writing Eat, Pray, Love, the pressure must have been so immense on Liz Gilbert to write her next book. And she talks about how she'd bought a house, um, I think in a, in a less urban area, and how it was time to be writing this next book, but all she really wanted to do was landscape the gardens around her house. All she was really interested in doing was learning about different kinds of plants and, and choosing how to place them around her new property. She wasn't in a place where she wanted to write. She was in a place where she wanted to dig and plant and learn about plants. And so that's what she did, she says in Big Magic. That's what she did. That's what she allowed herself to do. And I just, that's what she trusted herself to do. And what happened? Well, it turns out that, you know, pun semi-intended, <laughs> the seeds for her, her novel, her next novel, The Signature of All Things, were in that landscaping desire as she learned more and more about the different plants available to her for gardening, she became curious about where they came from and how they got here. And so that's um, The Signature of All Things, which is such a fun book, in my opinion. It's a wonderful read. 
it takes as its kind of backdrop and premise the house of a man who imports in the middle 19th century, who imports exotic plants. So maybe you are stuck because you want to write something or record something or you want to create something and you can't quite seem to move forward. The question, what do I want to do, may not yield an answer that has, that seems to have anything to do with that project. But what happens when you trust that the answer, take a nap, go for a drive, learn more about exotic plants, loaf and invite my soul to observe a spear of summer grass? Maybe the answer to what do I want to do is actually the thing that will take you in the direction of this project or towards something better, something better suited, something that is more about who you're becoming. There is such self-trust and self-honoring in listening to the answer that comes when you ask yourself, what do I want to do? And I have to tell you, our friend Walt, again, at least in his persona, had that self-honoring, self-trust. When I say he was a self-styled celebrity, I really mean it. When he published Leaves of Grass, he always published it with a photo of himself. And in the beginning, you know, it's like daguerreotypes, I think they were called, uh, the way that he was able to be rendered. And then each time he would release a next kind of version of Leaves of Grass, there would be a new photo uh, involved. And it's funny, I don't think he was taking them himself, but I like to think about him as sort of the original king of the selfie. He just always liked for you to see him. He wanted his body, his image, to be associated with his work. He also, and I, I want you all to appreciate this, he would re-release Leaves of Grass, so most of it the same, but then with a small addition or a small edit. So I just want you to imagine if Beyonce just kept re-releasing Lemonade but with a different cover and one additional song. I mean, I, she sort of did with Homecoming. <laughs> she, there's a lot of lemonade in Homecoming. Um, just what kind of deep self-honoring and, and declaration of value of one's work is in that approach to being. When we ask ourselves, what do I want to do? And the answer is, you know, I want to talk about something I've talked about a million times, but in a different way. We heed it. We answer it. That's why I'm talking to you right now about this spell. What do I want to do? Okay. So number one, desire lives in the present. Number two, whatever your desire is, it's good. Walt Whitman says, I harbor for good or bad, I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. Nature without check, with original energy. That is to say, listen to your desire, do what you want, and that is how you access original energy, meaning the energy of origin, the energy of new beginning, the energy that gets you unstuck. Okay, one more piece here. There is pulsation and flow in desire. Desire, like emotion, is meant to flow. So when we say it's all good, all the answers are good, that is to say, I want to cry on my bathroom floor, that is good, with a caveat. If you're stuck there, 
it's not exactly desire and want that is likely impelling your choices. When I ask myself, what do I want to do? I want to watch Netflix all day. Okay. Very likely, actually, for me, if that's my answer, I want to watch Netflix. I'll take off the all day because, again, desire is in the present moment. And I will sit down and I will begin to watch and I will enjoy myself. But if I'm really allowing myself to do what I want to do, the Desire for more Netflix will eventually wear off. Have you all discovered this for yourself? When you really allow yourself to do what you want to do without any hitches or contingencies or self judgment, you just say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're eating brownies. Okay, this is what we're doing. We're watching television. Okay, this is what we're doing. We're crying on the bathroom floor. I'm not going to hold back. I'm just going to go with it. Without self-judgment, without that pressing that break, we indulge the desire and then the desire shifts because desire, like emotion, flows. So it is not a problem to be sad unless sadness doesn't flow into another emotion, in which case I need help reconnecting to the ability to allow emotion to flow. A desire for a glass of wine is not a problem. A desire for glass after glass after glass after glass of wine, I'm stuck now. I'm stuck now, and so I may need help having a different relationship with desire. So I want to put that little kind of caveat in there or that, that, that understanding in there. What you want is good, and also wanting lots of things wanting lots of modes, wanting sometimes to celebrate myself and sing myself, and then wanting sometimes to loaf and lean and observe a spear of summer grass. It's that pulsation, it's that flow that also enables life to move forward, that also keeps me unstuck. It's actually another way of thinking about unstuckness. The ability to move, the ability to evolve and to respond to the ever-changing circumstances around me. So we know that Walt Whitman loved to travel. He traveled quite a bit for a person in the mid-19th century. And he also, in his, in his work days, when he was a journalist in Brooklyn, He would often go out and wander the waterfront during the workday, and wandering the waterfront was not working, so meaning not writing. And also, he clearly did that as part of the process of writing. So when we expand our understanding of creative process, We expand it to include rest. We expand it to include a walk along the waterfront. We expand it to include watching an episode of a great show. We expand it to include lying in bed all morning because it just feels so lovely in bed. When we expand our understanding of creative process and we accept it, when we ask ourselves, what do I want to do? And then we really do what we want. We keep that flow moving. We keep that urge and urge and urge, the procreant urge of the world. We keep it pulsing and moving. Pulsing really importantly, sometimes ebbs and sometimes flows, sometimes flows and sometimes ebbs. And as this current of desire ebbs and flows, the landscape shifts. So I want you to imagine being at the beach and getting into the water, playing in the waves, and having a moment where there's a strong undercurrent that moves your body without you really noticing it. You're You're sort of playing in the waves as they rise and fall, and then you look up and 
you're several yards down the beach from where you began. We have to remember that when we are open to living with this flow of original energy, the flow of life, we are very receptive to co-creation. We are receptive to being moved. So think of Liz Gilbert needing to write a book, and she had an idea, something that she was kind of toying with as her next book. But then by responding to the desire to landscape her garden, the current pulled her in a new direction, and she wrote a gorgeous novel out of that. She created something that she didn't expect to create. That is definitely a side effect of being in the world in this way. Being open to co-creation means that new possibilities become available. When I'm asking myself moment by moment, what do I want to do? I'm responding to this present moment, what I can see right now. As we all know, after living through the year 2020, we can't know what will happen, how radically and deeply everyday life can change. We can't know the opportunities that will be available. We can't know the challenges that we'll face. And so when we go with the ebb and flow of desire, and when we allow ourselves to be moved by the deeper currents of creation, we find ourselves in this evolutionary way of being. That's how Walt Whitman eventually became a nurse in the Civil War, and how that occupation became part of his extraordinary life. He was writing and reporting, and he began to visit wounded soldiers. And he loved it. He loved connecting with and caring for the men who had been injured. He loved being with the reality of the horror of war, turning toward it, understanding it, and bringing comfort to people who had fought in the war. He wanted to be there. He wanted to be with those young men. He didn't tell himself, oh, I'm a writer. I should be writing poetry. No, he did what he felt he needed and wanted to do. And then, yes, beautiful poetry and letters emerged as a result. So when we use this spell, what do I want to do to get unstuck, we are in some ways releasing the need to control what happens next, or even maybe the illusion that we could control what happens next. We're opening up to a bigger energy, original energy, as Walt Whitman would call it, to move through us. At the same time, let's be real. On occasion, you have a project which is not dreamy and of the deeper currents of life. It's your taxes. It's your article that's on deadline. It's your cluttered room. You can still use this spell in that place. What do I want to do? And you can still find something that will at least move you out of stuckness and in the direction of completing the project. Often for me, one of the best things I can do to spark action, to get myself unstuck, is to ask myself, okay, in this project, what's one thing I want to do? And then whatever that thing is, well, you know, I don't really want to write anything at all, but I do want to collect a couple of books that I wanted to reference. Okay, collect the books. Excellent. That's a step in the direction. When I ask myself, what do I want to do regarding my taxes, filing my taxes? I don't want to do anything at all. Okay, but what do you want to do? What's something that appeals? Well, it's appealing to 
collect all of the envelopes that have arrived with all of the different forms. Because right now they're spread all over the house and I and that's that's irritating to me. So collecting them, that sounds like something that I want to do. This is a much less romantic way of using the spell, what do I want to do? But when we are facing a requisite project and we find that one piece that appeals slightly, that one place where we might be able to get a toehold, what happens is a dispersal of the stuckness energy. We collect the resource books, we collect the tax forms, we take a small step in the direction of completion, and we trust that a moment will come that we want to keep moving. And that by opening up the flow of energy, by stepping into our power in this present moment, we've broken the curse of stuckness and we've begun to move in a new direction. Okay, the spell for getting unstuck is asking ourselves, what do I want to do? What do I want to do right now in this moment? And then accepting the answer and watching as this desire takes us next to a new desire. Watching as whatever curiosity is sparked or reserves are replenished by the answer, by that action that we take, then leads us into the next action. To finish here, I want to read you a passage it's near the end of Song of Myself. You are also asking me questions, and I hear you. I answer that I cannot answer. You must find out for yourself. This is so important. You are the only one who can answer the question, what do you want to do? You're the only one. It's your wanting. You must find out for yourself. Okay, keeps going. Sit a while, dear son. Here are biscuits to eat, and here is milk to drink. But as soon as you sleep and renew yourself in sweet clothes, I kiss you with a goodbye kiss and open the gate for your egress hence. Pulsing. Sit a while. Have some food. Have some milk. Sleep. And then you go. Next line. Long enough have you dreamed contemptible dreams. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. You must habit yourself to the dazzle of the light and of every moment of your life. I read this as, long have you been wanting into the future that's not here? Long have you dreamed other people's dreams? Long have you wanted what you want to want, wanted what people are telling you you should want? But now I wash the gum from your eyes. You must habit yourself to the dazzle of the light right here and of every moment of your life right now. Last bit. Long have you timidly waited, holding a plank by the shore. Now I will you to be a bold swimmer, to jump off in the midst of the sea, rise again, nod to me, shout and laughingly dash with your hair. How do we get unstuck? We open our eyes to the power of right now. We love and honor ourselves so much. We trust ourselves. We trust in the power of co-creation, of evolution, so deeply that when we ask ourselves the question, what do I want to do? 
we listen and love and heed the answer. So wherever it is that you're stuck, a big project, a little project, or just today, this day in your life, I hope you'll try out the spell, What Do I Want to Do? And I know that when you listen to the answer, magic will happen. Get to it. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mind Witchery. To catch all the magic I'm offering, please subscribe to the show. Or if you want a little bit of weekly witchiness in your inbox, sign up for my Sunday letter at mindwitchery.com. If today's episode made you think of a friend or loved one, your sister, your neighbor, please tell them about it. We need more magic makers in this troubled world. Like all good things, this podcast is co-created by stellar people. Our music is by fabulous DJ, artist, and producer, Shami D. Our gorgeous art is by the sorcerers at New Moon Creative. Mind Witchery is produced in conjunction with Particulate Media, K.O. Myers, executive producer. And I am Natalie Miller. Till next time. Hello. As promised, here is a little bit of info about my new group coaching program called Crucible. You know what a crucible is. A crucible is a container in which transformation occurs. It's a strong container, basically like where you melt down metals so that you can make new things. You can make alloys. And my program is called Crucible because it is designed to give you a space where you can summon the courage, the inspiration, the momentum that you need to finally take action on, to finally manifest that thing that you have been wanting to do. And what is that thing? I don't know. That thing might be a new offer if you are an entrepreneur. That thing might be the idea for the book that's been swirling around in your head. It might be an outline for that book. It might be a whole short story. That thing might be a job description for the assistant that you've been wanting to hire. That thing might be your own podcast. Whatever that thing is that you keep thinking, oh, someday I'd really love to make this happen. Crucible says, let's do it now and let's do it together. So Crucible offers seven weeks of group coaching. Crucible offers insight into how it is exactly that I take an idea and make it real. Right Now, this is not about me kind of imposing my method onto you, but it is about sparking your own creativity and insisting on a self-honoring way of creating. Yeah? Crucible is about community with other people who are also making it happen. And I cannot even begin to put into words how valuable that is how much of a difference it makes to be surrounded by other people who are expanding and growing into what's next. Crucible is in large measure about helping you to claim the time and energy that you need to create what's next. And so we'll use my anti-planner, Time Witchery, to do that. We will use co-working sessions that are hosted by Flow Club. I'm very excited about that part in particular. So Crucible is not assuming that you have the willpower and courage and time and energy to make this thing happen. In fact, Crucible says, oh yeah, Let's give you a place to generate that, to generate all that you need 
in order to manifest what it is that you want next. So you are invited. You can go check out Crucible at timewitchery.com slash crucible. We begin on April 10th. We go through April and most of May, and then we get to take off for the summer having finally taken action on that thing, that thing that you've been toying with, flirting with, wondering about, dreaming about for so long. So again, more details at timewitchery.com slash crucible. I super, super hope you will meet me inside.